Well, thank you for having us. It's a real pleasure to be here. And it does seem strange that I think, yeah, we were all together right before uh, somebody said the last fun event we all got to do in person. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so Stephen, I, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'm really glad to be here as well. It, was, <clears throat> it feels like ages ago that we were all together, uh, but really critical to be here and be able to talk about everything that's going on and what we can be doing uh, as a collective. So for, for folks who aren't familiar, I mean, do you wanna give a little bit of context on sort of what the Eastside community's thesis is and sort of how you came to it? Yeah, sure. So um, everything that we do at Bronze Investments is organized around our East Side investment thesis. And that comes from uh, a, an observation that developed over many years, uh, which came from our work targeting marginalized communities, exactly the sorts of communities that are erupting across the country right now in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Um, <clears throat> The East Side observation really just looks at a range of the mechanisms for marginalization, whether it has to do with access to food or healthcare or financial services, transportation, access to clean water, certainly pollution, and on down the line, things many of you would um, suspect and others you, you wouldn't expect. Um, and we realized that there was this insidious pattern, which is that if you actually look at the places that are most distressed, they tend to be on the east side of towns. And I spent years, I was trained as an anthropologist, I spent years trying to understand what that was about. And I finally figured it out. It had to do with um, particulate matter and the direction that the wind blows. And from, a, from, a, from a, an air pollution perspective, <clears throat> most of these places due to the rotation of the earth and direction of the winds uh, happen to be on the east side of town. And so we really cemented the work that we do in that understanding. Um, and I will make a point about uh, this that I think folks often get sidetracked on because, you know, I think the um, instinct is often to look for the counterpoint and say, oh, you know, well, the west side of this place is actually the one that's distressed or south side here. I was born on the south side of Chicago, which, by the way, is the furthest east you can go if you go further east here in Lake Michigan. But what I wanna say is that's beside the point. Um, it's usually on the east side, but sometimes it's in some other cardinal direction. The, the, the fundamental point that we're focused on is this distinction between haves and have nots, which is again, why we see people erupting across the country here in the US and around the world standing in solidarity with us. Um, and to put a, a, a last final uh, finer point on it, it's not just that there are haves and have nots. We don't assume that everyone is gonna have exactly the same thing at all times. But what we're really focused on is uh, these scenarios of disparity by design, where it's intentionally architected to suppress and marginalize people. Um, and that has been essentially the history of the United States. Almost every city in our country was built during the era of legal segregation. And so that design logic um, permeates pretty much everything we do. And so as a firm, we're focused on making investments that uh, turn that around. And as you do that, I mean, you know, people I think, you know, or who are used to sort of working in place have primarily thought of it as sort of a real estate strategy or a physical strategy. I think what's interesting about sort of what you've done at Bronze is that you're trying to sort of do this from as much a venture perspective as others. And so sort of curious sort of how you came to wanting to do this work by venture um, and sort of how you think about innovation in that context. Absolutely. So <clears throat> Bronze actually started as a multi-asset class manager, but as the platform was growing, we felt like we were getting further away from innovation um, because, the, you know, the multi-asset class allocators are basically doing that. They're allocating. It's very algorithmic. It's mathematical. Um, what we need are new solutions to old problems. And the folks who are building those new solutions are early stage entrepreneurs. That's why we went back and started building an early stage venture capital fund so that we could play a role in catalyzing innovation um, and getting other investors in Silicon Valley and elsewhere to do the same thing, to look at these communities, not as uh, places of solely distress, but places of opportunity. These are massive markets. We have a you know, $20 billion plus or minus uh, GDP, $20 trillion GDP economy. 70% of that is consumer spending. A lot of those consumers live in East Side communities. So there's a massive investment opportunity there 
we think uh, driving the early stage innovation economy is really important. And what what makes you? I mean, one of the things that we've seen in our work is, I mean, is the the ability to sort of take insights from one part of the portfolio and sort of put them in some, you know, take them across other parts. And so that ability to sort of see venture and innovation solutions, but how they can play out in place is something we've done very deeply in Newark uh, communities around the country. But how do you get more capital to flow into this? How do you get more people doing this um, at the scale we need, given that it is a $20 trillion problem? Well, it's starting to happen. Uh, you know, I think a lot of change is happening right now, uh, and literally hour by hour. I mean, I think in the last 24 hours, I've seen two funds uh, announced, SoftBank announced a $100 million fund, uh, Andreessen Horowitz announced a much smaller fund, but uh, you're starting to see movement toward funds managed by people of color and investing in people of color, which I think is it's good and necessary, but it's also not sufficient because if, if the sole framework is investing in people of color, we could easily end up with an outcome where we've got people of color investing and behaving in the same ways as investors before. So it needs to both, we need to both open the aperture for people of color and get people connected to investment theses and practices that are really driving impact in an authentic and fundamental way. Um, I mentioned that Braun started as a multi-asset class manager, and we have focused on the innovation portion through venture as an asset class. We've learned a ton about innovation, but we also understand the role that we play as managers. And so to get to your question about bringing more scale to the system, not every problem can or should be solved with venture capital. You mentioned real estate, for example. Um, <clears throat> There is a, a great researcher at, at uh, the Brookings uh, Institute uh, named Andre Perry, who's done work looking at the uh, scale at which housing in Eastside communities has been devalued. And the aggregate number, uh, just by virtue of, you know, sort of the perception that people have. Uh, uh, relative to where those assets should be, the gap is $156 billion. Okay, so that is a, a massive investment opportunity. Um, I think we are looking at partners like, you know, Andre and others. And what that does is it points a giant uh, arrow to asset classes like real estate, where you can imagine us and others expanding in the future with our East Side thesis. Okay. And so, you know, one of the things that I know we talked about in D.C. was sort of the, the notion of sort of how innovation, though, is constrained by some of the systems in which we've come to sort of fund it, if you will. And that, I, you know, I take, for example, sort of the venture capital model, which is in so many ways, I mean, a, a system that sort of, you know, I think, adds to the sort of exponential problems we have in this society and that returns are sort of exponentially given to some and consequences are exponentially given to others. And curious sort of how you think about those structural biases, if you will, sort of in venture and, and how to sort of do that better? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, like many systems, uh, the institutional financial markets are very well entrenched in themselves and have a set of practices and a culture and uh, a way of being and doing um, that is very specific. And um, what we really need is uh, creativity to think about how to solve old problems in new ways. That's why entrepreneurs are so important. Um, so I, I, I shared a story in DC when we last all saw each other, which, you know, uh, I think is an instructive metaphor. It was about playing the game Monopoly with my family, two daughters, my wife. Um, at the time, my two girls were very, very young. Um, and my youngest daughter, uh, who had just learned how to read and, you know, of course, went out first playing Monopoly. And she started crying and she felt forlorn. So I asked her to come sit with me um, and bring her assets from the Monopoly game to me. And we would partner so she could not feel like she was, you know, not part of our group. Uh, the exact same thing happened with my second daughter. Um, and so I invited her in the same way to sit with me. And I realized I'm sitting with my two daughters playing against my wife and their mom. And that was a horrible um, feeling. And in that moment, I had a realization, which is that I, I, I realized we were playing the game Monopoly the wrong way. We were playing against each other when at that point in the game, we already owned all the property. And so I said to them in an attempt to keep my family together, 
why don't we play together? If we just decide not to charge each other rent, we could actually play against the bank. And um, I won't go into the you know equation, but I actually realized, oh, there's an equation. You can calculate exactly how many laps it takes, depending on the number of players you have and getting $200 to pass go, that it would take you to own the entire bank as a, as a group. And I think for me, part of the, the take home lesson from that is I would not have thought about changing that system in the same way if I didn't feel the pain of like not wanting my daughter to cry or not wanting to have tension with my wife. It was my love for my own family that made me look at that playing field differently. And I think that is the difference between optimization, which would be how do I charge higher rents? How do I get the most property? How do I get other people to go bankrupt quickly? Uh, the difference between that and innovation, which is I have a board, I have some rules, I'm playing with some people, but how do I get to uh, an outcome that feels more just and importantly, more joyful? And that's the kind of innovation that we need right now. It's not about rote followership of existing rules. It's about a moment where we are saying our world is on fire, literally. And what are we going to do to employ the love that we have for each other, to look at the structures that we have and the processes that we have, and to figure out how to express that love through those institutions. And that is what I see as the difference between optimization and innovation. And we need much more of the latter than the former. And so, I mean, that vision is so inspiring. And I, I think it's something that's brought us together is trying to find a way to allow that human dimension to come through in the investment process. And yet, when you look at ESG and you look at what's going on in the broader marketplace, so much of it seems to be about the abstraction of impact and taking us away from, I think, what brought so many of us here today, which is actually that joyful human connection. Have you had any luck in, you know, when you go to meet with investors in really being able to sort of have them think differently about what it means to be an investor as opposed to being sort of an abstract entity that's getting 10 point fonts on your you know, quarterly yeah. statements, but somebody who's actually active and experiencing that joy? Um, do you have some compelling examples of how that might have worked? I have, you know, I mean, I think, you know, there it, it's, it's happening in a punctuated and accelerated way right now. So, I mean, literally over the last 72 hours, uh, given everything that's going on, I have had people reach out to me and say, uh, I get it now. I see what you've been talking about. And these are in some instances, conversations that have been happening for like 15 years. Okay. Uh, uh, and people are, are saying, okay, I finally made it across the line. I, I get what you're talking about. And I've had people say things like, I'm changing my will. And I want to talk to you about where my assets should go. I'm having conversations about family repair, where there have been rifts between grandchildren and grandparents about things that may have happened in the past and, and the, the values that grandchildren have now. And there is a healing that's happening as uh, capital is starting to be aligned with solutions to problems that we've created in the past. And I think that's very um, encouraging and we need to see more of that. And, and we are seeing more of it. For the people in the audience and what, I mean, what after this sort of horrific week that we've lived through and that's like, quite frankly, it's been a pretty rough 2020 going back. Um, what, what would you want people in the room to be doing differently? you know, as, as of this last week? I mean, how do we harness this, this, you know, this traumatic moment for something better? We need to get to scale. I've been doing this work for 15 years. I feel like I've been banging my head against the wall. I'm hoping that now is a crucible moment and, and more of the people like the ones that I mentioned uh, have caught the religion and they understand the opportunity to have a meaningful direct impact. I mean, all these people here, you know, talking about social impact, you have black managers like me and others who have been out here doing the work for 20 years in some instances, certainly in mine. And we need capital, we need support, we need scale. Um, and I also think we need the trust and respect of uh, capital providers to employ the kind of innovation that I talked about. It's not gonna be, it, it probably won't look exactly as it has in the past, but trust us to get there. And for folks who want to support, uh, please reach out to us, bronze.vc slash ally. Well, thank you so much, Dave. This has been fantastic as always. And so thank you to the folks at Social Innovation Summit. I appreciate you, Amit. Thanks.